Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. And welcome, everybody. Good to have you back. Uh, we are watching you on Restream, and of course, we're up on Clubhouse as well. Uh, we will take calls from Clubhouse. We've got an uh, interesting week coming up on Thursday. Uh, Brigadier General coming in. He's got a new book, but we'll also talk a little bit about the situation in um, Ura Ukraine. And I don't know if, uh, how you guys feel, but I hear lots of people who, and Jeremy Murphy will be with us again on Wednesday. Um, a lot of people are talking about military, sort of complex military operations that I know nothing about. And oftentimes they know nothing about. So I just thought we had to get somebody in here who knows something about it. Very, very smart guy with a lot of experience. So I'll get his, pick his brain a little bit. We are uh, mixing up the topics a little bit, and today is uh, no exception. Today, I want to introduce the guest. It is Dr. Roger Nelson. He conducted research at Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory from 80 to 2002. In 97, he created the Global Consciousness Project with a group of researchers working in the boundary areas of physics and psychology. This fascinates me greatly. Now there are over 100 scientists, artists, others around the world. The purpose is to examine the correlations that may reflect the presence and activity of consciousness in the world. And of course, Susan, you're very excited about this because I love this it. is stuff you play around with all the time. But I like I like this because it's more um, it's more clinical and also it talks about world affairs, which I'm really into, but it's really hard to get psychic mediums to talk about world affairs because they're too afraid. Interesting. Well, let's bring Dr. Nelson in. Dr. Nelson, welcome. You Thank are. you, Dr. Drew. Did did I do you justice in terms of uh, the description of your project? You didn't tell anybody I was a sculptor at heart. Okay. But then <laughs> I didn't tell out. you. They didn't tell me that. You didn't tell me. Is it? Uh, Wait, we should have known that. Are right? you sculpting with a chisel like Michelangelo in in uh, marble, or are you sculpting in clay? So. Oh, not exactly like Michelangelo, <laughs> but I um, my favorite medium is actually bronze casting, which you start you start with something like clay and uh, make and make a cast um, around the clay model and then fill it with bronze. That's fun. Yeah, I, I it is, and I I for whatever reason the the bronze that that process of bronze statue um i don't know stayed with me because there's a da vinci museum where was i probably in rome. milan or rome or something no we were in athens no we? no no it was a long time ago uh -oh. and he had planned a giant horse as i remember and, and had all these incredibly uh complex engineering plans to make the parts of it and never never quite did it which was sort of typical of him but it was gonna be this mat is am i am remembering that correctly well, I, I don't know exactly, but that certainly sounds like the kind of problem you would confront if you wanted to build a, you know, a monumental uh, bronze uh, casting. You have to do it in parts and then yeah, weld yeah. it together. And it was, it was yeah, a, I could never figure that out. He had out. all kinds of plans to dig, you know, anyway. It's not, amazing not the, what, what men used to do <laughs> with their hands. Well, so, so that's you. kind of the direction we're going. <laughs> Yeah, it distracted me. So I, oh, I'm, yeah, easy, yeah. I'm easily Don't be careful. Yeah, you love the art so, history stuff. So, so you're a physicist uh, by profession. Is that accurate? Actually, I'm a psychologist by profession and a physicist by background. In in, in psychology, what what kind of psychology is, are you? A licensed clinical oh, psychologist, a social psychologist, a... experimental psychology, experimental. looking mostly at perception, memory, um, and neurophysiology also. Okay. All right. So let's start with that. What's your basic constant? There's a lot of um, a lot of ideas flying around right now. Um, there's a lot of uh, a sense I've noticed or, or acceptance of the model, and I'm blanking her name. It's like Lisa. Uh, mm, can't remember her last name, but the, essentially that the brain is sort of a future predicting machine. 
uh, I'm not sure I'm fully on board with that whole uh, construct. How, how, what, where, what kind of ph philosophically, where do you come from in terms of your psychology? <laughs> uh, I actually, my uh, philosophy developed a little earlier and then much more it developed later. So the psychology part of it isn't much, you know, it doesn't have much uh, leverage in my philosophy. I basically am a, a kind of idealist, perhaps. Uh, I'm not um, a philosopher, you know, I don't talk about or think about those kinds of things much, but my friends do, and so I'm all, often involved in those conversations. Basically, I think we have a, you know, a, a very interesting world that we live in, and our descriptions of it are just beginning to make some sense. And there are lots of parts of it that we don't uh, have any description for at all. And one of those, one of the most important of those parts is consciousness. Like we have mm -hmm. terrific models in physics for uh, everything else, but not for consciousness. And we know consciousness is real and it lives in the world because that's where we are. We're right in the middle of consciousness all the time. And yet we don't have we have no mathematics for it, so to speak. And the the neuroscientist I was trying trying to think of was Lisa Feldman Barrett, who I'm, I've tried to speak to a couple of times and had no success yet. Uh, idealism. Uh, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding what you mean by that, because sometimes, sort of in the Bishop Barclay world of idealism, I think of it more as idea ism <laughs> you know like yeah. ideas have existence in the mm -hmm. world is that the kind of idealist you are it's more the kind of um, idealist who thinks that consciousness is fundamental and uh, underlies everything and is really the source out of which the material world comes there's very little um, evidence for that um, model and equally little evidence for the dualistic or the materialistic uh, model, we have no idea. We're still like sort of scratching at the, you know, the tablet where the questions are, and much less the answers. Mm -hmm. And how did you arrive at this construct? Uh, <laughs> somebody asked me, "Well, what do you think about this, and what do you think about that?" And I had four alternatives, so I picked one. I might as well have flipped huh. a coin. And it just, and you just kept going down that path. Well, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I probably shouldn't have uh, brought up idealism because um, it's not an ideal topic for me to talk about. Yeah. Because at some, at some level, I guess what I really should call myself in terms of philosophy is an empiricist. My whole mm. um, career, my, basically my, the thrust of all of the things I'm interested in has to do with, uh, you know, Taking measures, uh, taking a careful look, a microscope or a telescope, and find out what the world look lo looks like in, in the context of the question you're asking. So that's what I do. My uh, my whole, uh, actually, my whole life. I really started doing this when I was in high school. Is uh, asking questions that can be answered in at least some uh, measure by doing experiments and finding out what the data say about uh the question you've asked i like that it teaches um it teaches us about the world in a way that may ultimately allow us to develop a kind of uh, comprehensive model or a, a, a philosophy if you will but without the empirical I, I, uh input we're yeah. in trouble and i'm getting a little confused on our ta on our terms here materialism versus physicalism right I, I i materialism sounds like more what you're describing because physicalism there's nothing beyond the physical right and so everything would have to be observed and strictly connected to the physical and i guess you could be of that philosophy and met and materialism sort of a little looser well uh, maybe um i i think of any anybody any uh point of view that looks at only the physical aspect of the world, I think is going to, you know, it, it's uh, practically by definition, missing some of the most important materials, if you're thinking about something like consciousness, 
as a, what what's right. the physical what, uh, the physical substrate of consciousness the brain it's right. not enough because we have things like experiences right. we know what red is like uh, but there isn't any brain uh, matrix and no neurophysiological model that will tell you why red looks like that you know what your experience tells you so qualia right as we're talking about yeah sort of, sort of what yeah qualia and, and um right. sears john sears went way down a road with that with uh mary in the room and all that is that is that sort of in your zone a bit in terms of what qualia are well, he's more again, he's more of a materialist he, he's a strict physicalist i think all right let me get you off that all right so it's unfair to me going all these yeah. different paths so qualia <laughs> you're confusing everybody so, too. so qualia is like what it's like what is it like to be a bat what's the qualia of being a bat is sort of the classic thing so and yeah. and that's something that has no direct correlate in the physical world per se but but whenever no, i think not, about that question yeah and whenever i think about that question though i always think about violins i literally think about a violin like yeah the music sort of has all kinds of physical properties but the totality of what's coming off the string what's going through the this the air with sound wave what's reflecting on the eardrum what is being transmitted to the very complicated oral system we have in our brain i I, I don't know what to do with all that. I, I don't know how to understand that uh, sort of as from the standpoint of, of consciousness, except to say to myself, well, I, I experience it and I experience all kinds of things with my brain, with the reticular activating system working and, and sort of certain aspects of my brain working normally so I can be present, so to speak, and have an experience. But what's coming off the string is not really anything, right? Not uh, not unless you have a listener. It's a bit like the tree in the falling in the forest. Right. You have to bring right. to the music uh, that's being played. You know, you, you bring to the sound waves that emanate from that violin your experience and your interest. And if you don't know anything about um, music, you might be impressed, but you'll be much more impressed if you are, um, you know, a fan of. Uh, Bach or Mozart mm -hmm. or whatever, whoever uh, is the source of the music, which is not a not the same thing as the notes on the paper. It's not the same thing as it's the vibrations of the string. The music is a right. like, conceptual structure at a different level, and I think that's where we right. actually live uh, most of the time. And um, hey, again, our models don't uh, deal with that very adequately. How though, but you said something specific about the, the music or the whatever we're picking up on, that it exists on a different level. Why couldn't consciousness be like that? Why couldn't it also exist on a different level, like the, the music coming off the string is a different thing than what's actually coming off the string? Well, I think consciousness does uh, exist at multiple levels. It's probably the, uh, you know, the, you ask me why, where this idealistic notion comes from or where it goes to, uh, ultimately it goes to something like saying um, it's consciousness all the way down, you know, all the way up and all the way down. But um, to answer your question more specifically, um, a lot of people talk about consciousness as if it is just a, the brain you know, functioning. And mm -hmm. most of us who um, think about it a little bit deeper or a little bit longer will come up with uh, some questions about that. Is it really? Is that all there is? Is just a, the meat sort of vibrating? <laughs> and, um, and most of us come up with the kind of, and, and this is even before thinking about life after death and uh, out-of-body experiences and all kinds of psychic stuff. Uh, people recognize that the that the the mind is really not the brain um, with just a different name. The mind does stuff that uh, we we couldn't possibly imagine uh, at at this point anyway. Um, a, a, a bunch of neurons actually accomplishing. Just for example, 
um, there's a there's very good evidence in uh, in lots and lots of experiments that we touch each other um, without touching, even if, if people are far away, even if it's tomorrow. We get uh, messages to and from uh, our friends and our loved ones. It's a common experience. Almost everybody in the world um, will say, oh, yeah, I had something like that. You know, and it's uh, much more complex usually than the business of saying, oh, um, the f phone is ringing. It must be Margie. So you answer the phone and sure enough, and it wasn't a planned call and that sort of thing. But there are, mm -hmm. as I say, good experiments that allow us to see that the mind is not encapsulated inside your skull, but it lives in the world and actually has a, has a role, a function in the world. Tell, tell us about those. <laughs> um, well, the research I've been doing for the last uh, 40 years is uh, asking whether consciousness, um, things like intention and attention and wishing and willing, do, uh, do, do those th things have any effect in the real world? And we substitute in a technological gadget called a random number generator in lots of experiments. There are many other kinds of uh, devices you can use for um, asking these same kinds of questions. But a random number generator is like a high-speed electronic coin flipper, and you ask people to try to get more heads uh, than uh, you should just by chance. It's supposed to be random. It should be 50-50. Ask people to get more heads. And they, they wind up being able to do it, not all the time and not by a huge margin. But it's enough that you can establish scientifically through good, you know, ordinary, uh, well-known statistics, you can establish that something happened to the random source or the random data stream coming out of the source that shouldn't have happened. It should not be possible for uh, a person wishing for more heads to get more heads, um, but they can do it. And then that also, that leads to to many other questions that I've been uh, more interested uh, as time goes by, things like consciousness fields developed uh, by groups of people. What about a group consciousness? Is there such a thing? And um, if so, can we use the same kind of technology to detect the presence of the global of the uh, group consciousness? And that leads to other kinds of questions, which ultimately um, became the basis for my global consciousness project which asks about a group the size of the planet and what is the evidence you've got so far well um on the in the global consciousness project i actually i can go back to the experiments in the laboratory with one person trying to work his will we have um 15 or 20 years worth of experiments with hundred, a couple hundred people, each doing a lot of trials at this. They succeed at such a level that it's um, improbable, um, like on with odds about a million to one, like that. Same thing with the field REG experiments, which we use to look at global consciousness. That doesn't have such a huge database, but nevertheless, the uh, accumulation of uh, non-random stuff happening, structure occurring in this, in what should be a random sequence, that builds up also to um, many thousands to one or maybe a million to one odds. In the Global Consciousness Project, we ran the experiment, a formal experiment for um, 17 years, 500 uh, independent experiments you might say that all combined together produce a uh, what the physicists refer to as a se seven sigma deviation that means it's seven standard deviations away from chance it's way out in the tail it's so far out in the tail that the probability or i should put it in terms of odds it's about a trillion maybe three trillion to one odds uh, uh, against that being uh, chance so it's and what was the observation again? Solid. What was this one? This is for the Global Consciousness Project, a formal series of 500 experiments. Uh, all together, the, there's nine sigma, seven sigma. Yeah, all together. You put them all together so, and you have a, um, 
you know, it's, it's a the kind of uh, departure from what should happen for random data that is so big that it, it meets the criterion for almost any of the sciences. Many people in physics and um, engineering are interested, but they they're they're still dubious because they they know they don't have a model for um, for explaining that, and they know we don't either. At least not yet. People think about it a lot. So the the and, but and the what, uh, the point is that we have really you, you good evidence. You, something going on yeah. there. You don't have a do you, you don't have a model. Do you have a hunch? What's going on? Uh, yeah, I do, uh, but it's a little you know and, a little. And, and, um, and I'm wondering if it, if it connects to your consciousness all the way down model. Yeah, it does all the way back. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with David Bohm, but he's a, um, a physicist who um, was very influential in the last century, he died um, maybe, I think maybe around 2000 or something like that. But he had, he talked about an implicate order and what that uh, was in his uh, model, in his mind, as a kind of background source and out of which everything arises. And the implicate order um, is not something we can touch directly, but there is something that he uh, described as active information that that can um, actualize something that has potential. It's in the uh, implicate order, it has the potential of coming into being, but it only does so if um, it's uh, guided by active information, which is sourced in some um, what he referred to as a kind of need for this thing, maybe a particle, might be a molecule, might be a, a, uh, an effect of transmitting healing information from one part of the world to another. And any of those things might be possible in potential, but they don't become real until they are actualized with the help of this um, active information. So that's the kind of model that I myself uh, lean toward. There are a few other people that think in those terms. Others um, have, you know, different ideas. Things like um, en entanglement, uh, which allows con things that have been once together to be always uh, connected in some strange uh, quantum entanglement way, uh, no matter how far apart they be and they, they go. Right. There, there is a, again, I, I'm no expert in this stuff. Uh, the information models I'm, I'm familiar with, I, I still have trouble getting my head around the information models of consciousness. I, I, I kind of get it the way you describe it, but it's a, it's a hard one for me. In terms of entanglement for people that don't know, this was a feature, it's a feature of, uh, of uh, mechanics, uh, of uh, the Schrodinger equation essentially that has it that if you study the electron spin of one atom in one atom, let's say on this table, and then we study another one 12 light years away on a star, they will be entangled by virtue of the observation. And one of the theories for that is, is that we're sort of a hologram, like there's some, there's some holism that from which these emergent things come hmm. i i'm way out of my league when i even think about that stuff entanglement has always <laughs> intrigued me um i i i'm wondering if there's anything i when i hear when i when i start thinking about um these kinds of phenomenon as uh you know people affecting each other at a distance one of the things i always wonder is um is there some property and this i'm going to ask you an unfair question but then you can no comment or no answer is perfectly viable but it, what sort of roils around in my head is a weird question mm -hmm. such as is there something about temporality is there something about space time that our brain doesn't perceive which is lots of things right our brain does not perceive perceive lots of things but is there That's something right. about temporality or space time that has us moving forward and backwards in ways that we just we just don't see do you, do you ever think there's anything to that? Um, I certainly think there is a, um, you know, a whole lot of work to do um, before we can become satisfied with where we are. You know, mo uh, right. Some uh, 
serious uh, thought goes into uh, into trying to understand what it means to have a future and to have a past. The only thing we actually mm -hmm. have is this right now. Yeah, right now. <clears throat> but we yeah. remember stuff. And so our brain or our mind or consciousness is filled with all kinds of experiences that we had yesterday and, uh, and 25 yeah. or 85 years ago. And those uh, yeah. experiences are, you know, they're stored somehow, somewhere. Some people think um, yeah. they're stored in the brain. Some people think maybe we need a little bit bigger uh, storage capacity than that. Interesting. And, Interesting. And, and the uh, physicists yeah. call that the arrow of time. The, the arrow of time is not the same thing as space time, and it's not the same thing as temporality. The temporality is sort of the global concept. Um, it's arrow of time is an emergent property of biology. Biology is the only thing that kind of has sequence in the universe, it, continuous change. Everything else is just now. <laughs> Everything else is just, is just happening or not happening, right. and sort of now. And, and, that's, and that's different than the arrow of time. It is different from the arrow of time. But uh, you know, in physics also, the arrow of time is quite important. There are things like uh, yes. the basic equations of quantum mechanics are uh, symmetrical in time so they mm -hmm. allow for and you know <clears throat> excuse me they provide a description that's adequate for both the future and the past as well as the present and um, right some some of my colleagues who are uh, asking questions like do we have precognition is it possible for us to get information from the future some of my colleagues believe, um, mm -hmm. yes, um, the answer is from experiments. Yes, we are able to get information from the future. And people will say, that's not a problem. We can describe that easily because of the uh, time symmetric equation. No problem. I myself have a little well, hard time wrapping my head around it. <laughs> well, I Even will just I say that, that the... the the time symmetry of of mechanics of, of uh, quantum mechanics has one little problem, and that's uh, that's entropy. And, and entropy keeps things moving in a certain direction. And and there's lots of confusion about what's why that's there and whatnot. And it's that nasty <laughs> yeah, entropy right. that gets involved with everything, right? Right. And, the, and so the arrow of time is so, a very big arrow. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so entropy, again, for those of you that may not be familiar with all these terms, it's yeah. a, sort of the increasing, it down for us. increasing disorder, uh, increasing disorder in the universe. It's the, it's the <clears> property that has it that all the oxygen molecules in this room don't suddenly go into the corner. It, they're constantly getting more complicated. Let's put it that way. And this get this stuff gets way complicated <clears> for me. There's another problem too in quantum mechanics, which is. Is the multiverse theory, right? That every time you make a quantum observation, we split into two more universes, and there are literally infinite universes on a quantum level. And, and I, that one just blows my mind. I don't know what to do with that. But, the, but oh, there are plenty of I multi, know what you, you know, what do they call that theory? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, that, I, actually I, I don't think Einstein it, would have been happy with that. <laughs> well, you know, there are serious people who do talk about multiverse. In fact, yeah, yeah. surprising people. Uh, but it's uh, it's my, some of my uh, uh, the most admired people in my uh, uh, realm are people who say, "Well, show me some evidence." Uh, well, how do you test that? And the answer, in a lot of cases, in multiverse uh, 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 splitting uh, universes every time any kind of decision is made, even by an atom, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. Right. There is no evidence. There is absolutely no evidence for that. It's a respected theory without any evidence, whatever. My my own personal instinct on this that the answer to that theory is unity. It's one, because ultimately, if you have enough universes, you 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 converge on one. You know what I'm saying? That it I becomes it. just one anyway. It. Yeah, so unity yeah. one is is my so any confusion about that my answer is one. That's my answer, and I, I proposed it to a, a very serious theorist, and he thought I'll think on that. <laughs> and okay, please do because it just intuitively makes sense to me. Um, but so let's go back down to the the monads of consciousness. I guess you sort of have right. Is that part of your theory that we're 
that atoms have consciousness and the, the this there there there's there's a theory like that out there. Is that you? Well, no, I'm I'm not a theorist. I don't write write uh, oh. theoretical stuff. I just you know when people ask me, I say, of course I think about it, and this seems mm -hmm. to fit the stuff I know best. So uh, mm -hmm. the, the the oneness that you mentioned, I mean the one is exactly in the center of what I think of as a kind of um, end, end point picture. You know, we are uh, the ancient cultures, every culture, every sage in every culture has, has said pretty much what you just said. We are one. And, uh, and that leads right to saying the universe is one. There is only one. <laughs> so I totally agree with you. And I think that uh, that's where we get to if we are really get serious about all the things that all the evidence that we have about various kinds of models that, that we uh, try that we that are not necessarily satisfying, but they are the best we can do for describing the universe we live in. It is a kind of unitary it, thing. It, it's, we start we start yeah, from nothing. Yeah, become one, and yeah. then we go right back to it. Yeah, and that's the the whole the the holograph theory too. Is that also there's just one that then has emergent properties essentially that that we're interacting with. But um, emergence is another thing that fascinates me. But I I don't want to deal with that's too big a topic for today. Uh, let, let, one of the things that sometimes frustrates me about conversations about consciousness is people don't define the term. So I wonder if you would define what we're talking about for me. Um, well, the, the reason people don't define the term is because it's ill-defined. We just don't mm. really. Um, it, it requires context. You may be familiar with Alfred Kozybski or kind of Count Hung. A, a Polish count who uh, wrote a book called Science and Sanity. And among the uh, rules they promulgated in this very thick book was that the map is not the territory. Um, but also that um, when we really write, come right down to it, there isn't any um, world except the one we directly experience. Consciousness? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll try, um, you know, waving my hands a little bit about consciousness. My first temptation in give, uh, being given that question is consciousness is what allows us to ask that question. But that's a little bit unfair to dogs because they uh, have consciousness too, only they don't ask questions like, what's consciousness? They just live in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So consciousness is, is a kind of um, umbrella term for the complexity of our um, mental life, if you if you will, that's almost a tautological uh, definition. But uh, we have a uh, uh, um, wide range of ex experiences, and when we try to understand them, we have to, we and we step back from that a little bit. We say, what's doing the understanding? How, are, how is this uh, process undertaken? And, it's, and so consciousness is a, for humans is a kind of um, coalescence of all kinds of um, uh, bits and pieces that um, are things like vision and hearing and uh, muscular uh, feelings and so on into um, an experience that's kind of whole, that is whole for most of us most of the time. And that uh, um, that uh, experience constitutes the consciousness that we have. Do, is a self necessary for consciousness? Um, you know, uh, again, self is a, a complicated word. I would. My first response mm -hmm. is yes, of course. Um, but um, maybe um, I was um, an admirer of. Uh, Indian shaman, a North American uh, shaman named Rolling Thunder. He was a, he was a very curious guy. And, um, he once, um, and this is in a book by an anthropologist who visited him for a while. He, um, he was um, out in the uh, wilds. They were uh, looking for herbs. And at one point, um, Rolling, Rolling Thunder said, yes, and a, a stone as consciousness too. So uh, what that might mean uh, really depends on the context. 
what so but I believe it may be true it's almost like the um, all the way down uh, if if we say that consciousness is a fundamental thing then consciousness has to be um, a part of every particle in the universe a, a very tiny very simple maybe kind of uh, consciousness but there's something about every particle in the universe that um, ha that uh, basically allows it to play the role it has. It will meet with another particle and fuse and become a more complex particle. It will fly off to the other end of the universe and still be entangled with its partner mm -hmm. in the original arrangement. And, and, and again, I'm still trying to get my head around what we're talking about there I, 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 are we are we talking about energy force is that you know is energy consciousness just energy well um in those uh, terms using that kind of terminology i think uh, consciousness is very much closer to information information i talk okay, about got it a kind of uh, you know, this global global consciousness project sort of wants mm -hmm. some explanation and and so I think about something like I talk about a, a consciousness field, and uh, in the next breath, I will say uh, by that I mean some kind of information field. It's like mm -hmm. um, what consciousness uh, does as a kind of in source of information is to um, present structure as a f function of being itself very structured. Mm -hmm. My consciousness presents structure to the world outside of myself. So in the laboratory experiments, my intention to get a high number or more heads, that is, that is presented as information to an ongoing stream of random numbers, which are unpredictable uh, by design. And therefore, it's in principle possible for them, for the next uh, number in the sequence to be different from what it might have been uh, because of the information that uh, is presented by my intention. I, I, again, these are very interesting concepts. I'm, I'm trying to get my head, I, I wanna be super careful with the terms. I, intention meaning your state of mind, essentially. Yes, my state of mind, but very specifically in the case of those experiments, my state of mind is high numbers, high numbers or low yeah, numbers. Yeah, you, you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, there's so, Susan. Go ahead. Okay. I figured this is where you'd want to yeah, come in. Yeah, you guys are. I <laughs> well, I had to. We had to get through all that. We had to get no, through get all it, these theories. So. You guys have to nerd out, and then we. Well, have I still to have more to nerd out on. Trust me, but but, but but go ahead. <laughs> you ask your question. I know. I know. I I failed physics. Just so you know. Um. <laughs> had to take uh weather instead to, <laughs> to get out of my uh, weather has consciousness i dropped, yes, it does. I dropped out of physics at one, i dropped out of physics at one point because i wanted more time for sculpture <laughs> uh, <laughs> right I get that. right I get that. so anyways i i wanted there there's a talking point that i want to talk about that you this part of your study is that you you assess the varieties of events such as the celebrations of new year's shocking events like the disaster on 9/11, uh, natural tragedies, and and huge like religious events. Is the, are these part of your study that you you know you're trying to look at the how people look at that and how they how their consciousness? Or did are you asking Susan? I, did, did our collective how consciousness does it, contribute to that, or how do yeah, we react well, to that? I mean, both? how did these studies sort of add to your data and, and okay, bring you right. to your <clears throat> results? Well, I, I, the it's a very good question. Um, it, uh, it requires that I say we're not studying those events and the, or the psychology of the people um, at all. Instead, we're identifying an event like 9-11 or New Year's. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we are saying, we're making a prediction that because huge numbers of people are coming together, I am sharing a kind of uh, emotional state um, might be fear, might be joy, it might be compassion. So this, this huge number of people coming together, we believe, will create a kind of information field, a consciousness field that uh, carries with it the structure 
um, from all those people, all those minds, uh, having a, a, an idea or an emotion and sharing it. it they become coherent, uh, re resonant with each other, synchronized. All of those things lead to, the, to what I call a group consciousness. And the prediction is that that group consciousness will present information to the world and that these uh, sensitive instruments, these devices called random number generators, uh, will absorb some of that information and their behavior will change ever so slightly. Or in the Global Consciousness Project, two of those devices separated by a thousand kilometers or even larger distances may become correlated. They may start acting like each other and uh, the, the reason we have eliminated other possibilities, the reason that the correlated thing is the mood, uh, intention, the uh, state of mind, the consciousness that people have and are sharing. Does that make sense? Or am I being yeah. clear? Makes sense to me. In, so in, those, in Susan, uh, so we, we, it out we to set up, a, we set up a series of events like that. And every uh, every time every time an event came along that we thought, you know, uh, uh, could <laughs> needed the attention or deserved the attention, uh, would potentially bring millions of people into the same frame of mind. So we set that event. We specify the beginning and the end of it precisely. We said, what's the statistical test we'll uh, will apply? And then after, uh, after all that's done and registered, then we pull out the data, which might be um, information from 60 of these devices spread around the world in a network. And we ask, is there any difference from pure random behavior? Is there any, any difference in the behavior of these devices or this network of devices that's correlated with this big event in human consciousness space? And the answer to that was um, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but about two thirds of the time it was yes. There was um, a deviation in the direction that we predicted. And um, that's was, the- What's the direction? Well, we, uh, the prediction in that case was there would be a positive deviation, meaning more mm -hmm. correlation uh, or more uh, distant, more, um, uh, larger deviations from the expected value. The expected value we know exactly, and, and the spread we know exactly. And what we were saying is we're expecting to spread more than that. So it mm. did in a sufficient number of the cases that that builds up to the trillion to one odds that I mentioned earlier. We, and all, these are formal um, experiments that are rigorous all the way down, and they mm -hmm. um, build up over the 20 year, 17 year period, we did that formal experiment to a, a, a truly impressive database, which um, by the way, is always has always been accessible to the public. And so there are lots of interesting analyses that other people have done. Not So it's not just those events that we looked at, but for example, I have a, a friend, a colleague in Sweden, who's been looking at uh, markets, stock market um, variations, and asking, is there any correlation of those stock market movements with uh, data in the GCP, Global Consciousness Project? And the answer that he found is, yes, there is. And uh, the same guy looked also at Google search index uh, uh, terms, the most popular ones. Is there any correlation of those? Could he make an index? of these uh, glo uh, Google uh, search terms and ask if that's correlated with the GCP or global consciousness data. And it is. <laughs> so, and uh, I'll, I'll mention one more, which is so esoteric, but um, it harkens back to entropy. What we're saying, what we see in the global consciousness data is that a system which is designed to be and usually is uh, fully entropic. That means it has complete entropy. There's no predictability about it at all. Um, that changes slightly under certain circumstances. So it becomes slightly less than fully entropic. Some people say it'd be, there's a, we add some neg entropy, negative entropy. And um, 
what that um, leads to, if you think uh, about it very long, is <clears throat> things like the uh, prediction that everything is going to, as you uh, mentioned before, we're, we're heading, the arrow of time is pointing toward dissolution of everything. So that in, that in the end, it will all be just entropy. But life is against entropy. Life is negentropy. Right. Life is not right. random. And these right. findings that we have in the global consciousness data are um, indications that you can, you can set up a system comprising a truly physical, random source and change its behavior by wanting it or by giving attention or by, be, by having synchronized emotions in large groups of people. It's pretty startling. Fascinating. I dig it. Fascinating. That, that's you know. We need you, to do more my, of that. But my, my brain went immediately to biology because it's like we we still don't know why biology was able to temporarily order the universe and how we how that happened, and uh, and then uh, also the, how the how the internet and social media has changed all this too. All right, we'll ask that question. We're <laughs> well, that's from one break. end to the other. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, tough. we'll take a look. Sorry, I, I see I'm more you. real. I'm more in the moment. I see your questions right. also on Clubhouse. We'll get to some of those. Uh, we'll, we are here, of course, with uh, Dr. Nelson. We're going to take a little break and be right back. Since the beginning of the pandemic, nearly one in five Americans has reported consuming an unhealthy amount of alcohol. Could be you, but only 10% of them are actually getting the help they need. Reframe is a neuroscience-based smartphone app that helps users cut back or quit drinking alcohol altogether. Using evidence-based tools, techniques, and content, Reframe guides users through a personalized program to help them reach their goals. Comprised of daily tasks, a comprehensive toolkit, a community forum, and accountability guides, Reframe is a modern, accessible, and affordable resource that can help anyone looking to reevaluate their relationship with alcohol. Reframe is backed by Harvard University and Emory University Schools of Medicine, and it is ranked the number one alcohol reduction smartphone app worldwide with over 350,000 downloads. With Reframe, there's no stigma, just science, no labels, just support. To learn more, go to joinreframeapp.com slash Dr. Drew. Use the code Dr. Drew for 25% off your first month or your annual subscription. That's at joinreframeapp.com slash Dr. Drew. Let's talk about our friends at Hydrolyte. I can't say enough about Hydrolyte. You hear me talk about them all the time. It gets me through workouts and medical procedures and colonoscopies and COVID. It absolutely contributed to my recovery from COVID. Hydration is key to feeling healthy, and there's never been a time when that could be more important. We're in the height of cold flu season. Every headache has got you testing for COVID. Staying hydrated can keep the questionable symptoms at bay, and there's nothing better than Hydrolyte to get it done. Taking their hydration formula one step further, now there is Hydrolyte Plus Immunity. It starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients. Plus, each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water to make a great-tasting drink that is a 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all-natural flavors. It's gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. That is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash Dr. Drew. And be sure to use that code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount. We are back with Dr. Roger Nelson, Global Consciousness Project. And uh, Dr. Nelson, during the break, my wife was um, querying. I was saying, look, we these events in the global consciousness affect random numbers generation in ways that are unanticipated. Now, what does that mean? And she kept going, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? So okay. I'll toss that to you. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it means uh, in uh, the case of a laboratory experiment, we have just one random number generator. It means that you get more heads when you're trying to get heads. It means just because you want them, that machine will not do what it's designed to do and produce a completely random stream. 
it will pr produce one that has a little bit of negentropy in it. It will have a little bit of structure where there should be none. And that is attributable to the intention that you have. In the Global Consciousness Project, it's not intention. Nobody knows, except for a few of us who are running the experiment, nobody knows what's going on. But we, when we come together in a synchronized and coherent fashion, we resonate with each other. We, have, we all share the same uh, vibrations, if you will. Then uh, that's a situation in which we ex expect to find structure in the network of random number generator data which shouldn't be there uh, if it, if there is uh, no such thing as consciousness or effects of consciousness in the world i don't know if that helps but ask me another version of the so question is that, I'll try. is that for the better good or is it like you're you're putting all kinds of uh experiential and value sort of elements into it that are not yet there um right, right. And, and well we'd just, love to be able yeah. to to uh, fix it, you know? <laughs> and uh, in yeah. fact, I yeah. guess I, I, I will say people uh, really want uh, to do some good. People would like to be able to stop a war, you know, by wishing it would stop. We don't um, have that yet. But I think uh, I'm gonna go for, sort of to the end of my spiel. Where, when I talk to people, uh, to groups, I usually uh, end up talking about the meaning and interpretation. And what I think we have evidence for in the Global Consciousness Project is an unconscious connection among us all. And I am conscious, I'm unconsciously connected to you guys um, and to Caleb in Alabama or New Orleans or where, wherever in central time. In other words, um, yeah. there is a kind of connection that we we really believe exists, and that is uh, part of what the data in the experiment actually um, allow you know give support to. So, what does that mean? That means that we human beings are connected in ways that we don't know about, and we ought to know about them. We ought to be practicing whatever. Um, teachings or whatever uh, thoughtful ideas that we might have or our friends have, we might need to uh, use some words like love and compassion and so on. But we need to try to bring up this unconscious connection so it becomes conscious. So I know mm -hmm. that I'm connected with you and, I, and we together can take advantage of that to create something that is two heads better than one. We can uh, improve principle i think we can even do something like amplify the power of good of uh, positive thinking or prayer or whatever you might want to call it if we want to stop a war we need to have all of us wanting to stop the war and somehow mm -hmm. connecting even with the people who are in, involved and engaged in and creating that war yeah i anyone that is sat in a uh, intense psychotherapeutic environment We'll have stories of uncanny information going back and forth of experiential nature. And so that's one of the, I have my own theories about what's happening there, but that's one of the reasons this interests me so much. Uh, here's somebody, Casey, who I'm about to pull up to the podium here. Uh, I believe conscious is an expression of energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. Uh, the soul goes on. Let's bring Casey up to, in club, Clubhouse. Casey, you want to go on from there? Or the brain goes on. Well, the, yeah, five, four, three, two, are. here we go. Yeah, I would love to go on from there. Oh uh, by the way, uh, doctor, mm -hmm. doctor, mm -hmm. it's a pleasure to speak with both of you. You as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I actually have a, a background in uh, agriculture. Uh, so we have always, just getting into the, the, uh, the fringe sides uh, of things, I, uh, we used to do things like uh, bless water. Mm. You can program water with positive or negative thoughts. Mm. Um, I, there was a Japanese experiment that happened in a subway where they would put uh, distilled water in front of a sign that would say something. One would say, like, the love of life. The other one would say, I hate you. And then they would freeze the water samples and look at the crystals. I hate you was jagged and just, you could tell it looked like stabbing, 
stuff uh, to where, you know, the love of life was very floral and fluid. Well, we did the same thing in school with water. Uh, we set up the signs, all this other stuff, and then we would test how uh, nutrients, fertilizers, would work in these different samples. Hmm. We were able to use around 15% less nutrient and get the same uh, results from the blessed water than from the, the negative water. Interesting. So, and, and we, what are we, 70% water? Uh, <laughs> so it's one of the, probably 90%. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it's more like 90%. 80%. Yeah. So yeah. Sorry, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> a lot of water. But yeah, so it's we're, one of those things. Yeah, it's a lot just, of water. Uh, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that, I mean, the, the kind of stuff you're uh, talking about is there. You're doing actual research. It sounds like, and there are a lot of people have, that have shown. Yeah, yeah. That uh, basically, what we are uh, you're talking about is a small effect of something like prayer or wishing, and the laboratory stuff is talking also about that same small effect. Only one is in, in dry scientific terms. The other one. Uh, produces better crops. I visited a mm -hmm. winery in uh, California that had that was using uh, uh, the the stuff that is the Swiss guy. They they basically would put they would take something like cow horns and bury that in certain parts of the fields and do blessings, and it actually produced extraordinarily good wine. At least so I thought. Mm. Uh, thank you, Casey. I'm going to bring Josh up. Um, interesting. Hi, Josh. Hey, What's up? How's it going? Um, good. I, you know, I think of this from a spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, the way I would think about it is um, if, if we know we have consciousness within ourselves, no one is saying that we don't. Uh, and if we start to believe that consciousness is outside us externally and measurable, which is what the um, your guest is is, is mm -hmm, saying. Mm -hmm. It it follows that we should sort of identify ourselves as consciousness in in our lives if this is what we're willing to accept. I mean, I feel like that's the next step. Instead of identifying ourselves as men or women or whatever attributes or or even the body, you know, I am the body as opposed to I am consciousness. If we were to start to identify ourselves as consciousness. That seems to be where we could go next, because then if everyone is thinking of themselves as consciousness, there, there isn't, there's no more separations. And it seems like we'd all be enlightened at that point. Mm. Uh, that's, so that's, yeah, I think that, Nelson, <clears throat> comment on that. well, I, I love the idea. I think it's probably correct. We're perhaps a long way from a, full implementation, but it's a, it's a good path. And it's one that has been trod by most of the sages in most cultures. Um, people, they, we, uh, we have wise men or wise women telling us that uh, we are one and that we, are, we really should practice uh, being one. I think there's a good chance that um, we're on the verge of, in my opinion, on the verge of uh, disaster, unless we do bring ourselves uh, together a bit and take advantage of the of the wisdom of the ancients and the wisdom of, of the the seers today. Susan, you have more questions? No, you I agree. Again? Like positive mental attitude, it, it all together is, would bring us as one. But also, just the idea that you know now we have all this technology and we can see like in the world that we have a big divide and somebody on here said something funny. Um, he said, if a troll sends a chat in the forest and nobody is around to hear it, does a troll even exist in the first place? The troll on the <laughs> internet. We're so well, this is back to your question about the internet and whether or not we never, we never dealt with that. Do you think that, I mean, if you look back in history of, you know, the collective uh, consciousness about Christ, you know, when Christ died and how we, you know, it became spiritual, a, a place for people to go, and and they all thought alike and prayed alike. Um, you know, but they didn't have the internet to send out information. And I think a lot of it was done through, you know, spiritualism. But um, but now, like, we're dealing with something. We're seeing the ugly things in life that you know coming right in front of our faces, and 
and hopefully I wish in a perfect world and I for my children especially I wish that you know we could use our consciousness to change things world events like this like if if we had that inside of our our souls and our and if we could pray like my my Polish housekeeper today I said how is your family doing in Poland she says we're praying every day you know for these people and in Poland mm. we're all praying so you know I mean I I get that I but I also think there is more to it than just saying, oh, I'm praying because I'm part of the team. You know, I think there is something that goes out if 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 we all, you know, have that same mindset. So I mean, I agree. Well, let's talk about electronic media. Do you do you uh, aware of any impact of, of that degree of connectedness? Are you you're asking me? Mm. Um, yes, yes, we <clears throat> we are uh, and there. We, there, I have a, a, the field that I belong to has um, a few hundred serious people, scientists uh, working to try to understand these kinds of things. And there are some people that are directly uh, ac uh, asking a person in a, an experiment to change the way um, an electronic device operates. I mean, something like a smartphone or the display mm -hmm. on a computer screen. So and um, the the, um, the situation is that um, there's very good evidence that we have uh, an ability that's um, that's um, we talk about it as we have an ability to create very small effects. They're real, but until we learn to uh, amplify them, and, and, and personally, that is for somebody trying to create a personal effect of this sort in the world uh, by prayer or whatever one of the best and in fact the uh, the very best medicine or recommendation for that kind of work is to get out of the way to accept the possibility to present that possibility to the universe and then allow it to happen these kind and i think that um it's possible i don't have very good evidence for this yet I think it's possible that um, we can uh, organize ourselves uh, and do more of that kind of thing with greater effect in the world. We do already have, uh, and I've looked at a number of them using my technology, uh, huge gatherings of people to meditate um, just for meditation, other huge gatherings to meditate on peace and march and demonstrate for um, to save the world from the ecological disaster that's confronting us, all of those kinds of things, and those we we can see that there are effects in uh, on this abstract uh, global consciousness random number generator network. Okay, so that's not yet saying that we have changed the outcome of the uh, of the <laughs> roulette wheel uh, spin. Right. But it, it is a it is a step in that direction. It's evidence that that is a direction that we should pursue. We should learn how to do it better. It's interesting. I I am realizing that when and it's why it's always bothered me that we don't really define consciousness because very often we're all talking about different things. I, yes. I realize the kind of consciousness I've always been interested in is really human experiential consciousness. Um, particularly social consciousness, interpersonal consciousness, that kind of thing. Um, and for me, I have a real specific f idea about what that is. And uh, that's more about two brains, at least, you know, more than one brain and, and, and how they affect each other. So, so a little. Right, you're a big fan of psychotherapy because that you, you work with another person's brain. Right, and right. But literally, it is that is that the self emerges in an intersubjective context. It comes from relating to other people. And then once the self emerges by seeing it reflected in other people and then understood you know, internally, it, there, there's something there that knows that it knows. Um, but I'm not convinced that a feral child that went into the woods at one and comes out at 15 has a self or consciousness. I think both, I think interpersonal, I think multiple brains are, are responsible for, for 
awareness and the way I think about consciousness uh, and for selfhood. I think that that's clearly emerges in a so social context, interpersonal context. Um, and that's very different kind of uh, <clears throat> phenomena than what you and I've been talking about today. We, we've been talking about fundamental physical phenomenon in the universe, right? Yes. But I think, yeah. you're, I mean, it's, it's a very uh, good track that you're on, I think, uh, because we have, um, <clears throat> even in this uh, first world country, we have a hell of a lot of people who are born into situations that are t terrible. They're almost as bad as being mm -hmm. a feral child in the woods. So they don't mm -hmm. learn mm -hmm. uh, the kinds of things they don't, they don't become. Uh, the kind of thing <laughs> that people have loving parents and a and a you know good food all the time uh, actually become so we, uh, there are very practical kinds of issues that have to do with what's consciousness what is the consciousness mm -hmm. of somebody who's beat up every day of his you know childhood yeah that's a very different kind of thing from yeah. There's a, um, uh, those of you who are watching may know a guy named Rob Henderson. Uh, Jordan Peterson interviewed him. I've interviewed him. He's a kid that was, came out of those kinds of environments, uh, ended up after addiction and prisons and other things, ended up in the military and ended up going to Yale and now Oxford, where he is a social psychologist. And he's written a book that's coming out soon where he describes this experience of going from the object of uh, chaos to someone with a fully developed consciousness, and it's quite quite impressive, quite impactful. What's the name of the book? That sounds great. I, it, it, his name is Robert Rob or Robert Henderson. Look, look for him. Robert uh, he Henderson. Has a, uh, okay. Yeah, maybe you guys. His, the book doesn't have a name yet, but but maybe you guys can. Uh, he's got a regular. He writes a lot. Yeah, he writes blog. emails on a regular basis. Uh, uh, what what's uh -huh. the name? Let me see if I can find. You can just That's Rob it. H. <clears throat> yeah. Rob. Yeah, I, I can uh, look up Henderson. Rob but you know, are you reminding me when I was a, a young professor, yeah. I was talking about uh, child abuse, and I said it's very hard for people um, to become, you know, uh, well human beings if they suffer that. Mm -hmm. And somebody came up, one of the students in my class came up afterward, and she said, "Be careful what you're uh, saying about these kinds of things. I'm one of those kids." And I uh, have worked hard, and I've come out of it. So uh, that, it's, it's a it's difficult, but it's possible. It's possible, but it 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 look it requires a lot of treatment and a lot of effort, uh, and it's a lot. And a different. collective consciousness. <clears throat> yeah, me. So um, it's Rob K Henderson oh, on is Twitter. It? Yeah, not H. So okay. Uh, okay. And uh, he his book ends with. A statement that I, I recapitulated in a little blurb I gave him, which was, it's much better to be poor in a family that loves you than unloved in a rich family. 100%, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, <clears> I the, think the, we have plenty of it. evidence of that. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, you may have a, another item or two on your agenda, but one thing I would like to mention is that there is a GCP 2.0 that's in development mm -hmm. now, and uh, it Tell will be, that. yeah, all right. It's uh, it's being put together by friends of my at the Heart Math Institute, which you probably know about. And um, there's a team actually of people from GCP and from uh, the Global Coherence Initiative, uh, Institute of Noetic Sciences, and also Heart Math itself. And we're building um, a, a thousand unit uh, network. It, it'll be, and each of those units will have four uh, different uh, random, in, independent random sources in it. So it'll be like more than an order of magnitude larger network. And it will take, uh, we'll collect and store potentially correlated data like social um, media uh, measures of one sort or another along with mm. stuff like uh, the, the geomagnetic flux, <laughs> uh, solar winds, mm. and stuff like that. Anyway, the idea is to um, try to answer, try to get more information that will help answer some of the questions that the original project raised but couldn't 
um, answer because those questions only came up as a result of looking at what we learned in the original. So I, uh, people were it's being run and being set up as a citizen science operation. That means that some somebody with um, interest um, can uh, join in and become a, a host for one of these units. It requires a, uh, it doesn't require scientific necessarily scientific background. Only uh, sincere interest, I guess, and a few bucks. Well, and, and where should people go for that? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, just go to Heart Math Institute. Heart, I think it's uh, Heart Math. Uh, or let me tell you one that I actually know. <laughs> uh, Global okay. Coherence Initiative is gci.org. Okay. And then follow yourself on Twitter at G-C-P-E-G-O? G-G. G-C-P. No, it's E-G-G. My project EGG, was originally so called the. It was originally called the Egg Project, EGG, for electrogiogram. My son, who was uh, the ar architect for the software that was, and this is 1997. He said, "You know what you're doing is like an EEG for the world." I said, "Oh, cool, interesting." Uh, and wow. he said, "You should call That's it cool. an electrogiogram, because you're doing yeah. an EEG for Gaia." So I'm reading one of your posts. It says, I'm reading one of your posts at the Global Consciousness Project on Twitter. It says, the GCP cover measure corresponding to the Ukraine invasion continues to show a strong trend. After four full days, it is probably against chance of 0 0.003. Not much likelihood it's chance. Comments of people close to the situation suggest more than anger, so that more than hang anger, we see a lot of compassion with the refugees and unprecedented did it, did it unprecedented will to help them. Compassion is one of the strongest correlates of GCP effects. It seems a major influence here. And then there's, well, a, like there's a cool chart, like it shows it. So like, I don't know, I guess I would like to believe that. It, it, it very minimum, if you participated in that kind of thinking, it certainly wouldn't contribute to the world being a less good place. It would contribute to the world being a more good place, and so there's no downside to. Uh, well, I think everybody is really sad, is really compassionate towards these people. Yeah. The problem is we got to get this guy. Can we use our collective consciousness to to make this man turn uh, into less? Some, yeah. some hey, hey, but what we have to do, negative. what we have we to do, is positivity. feed him a hell of a lot of love. <laughs> so because he's yeah, obviously I, missing maybe. something. Yeah. Mm. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. It's, a, maybe. it's horrifying. <laughs> send him some neg entropy all right yes Dr. Some Drew neg, has uh, it. Neg, ent <laughs> neg entropy no so, it's interesting though well listen dr Nelson, it's been really fun really interesting and uh thank you for the work again the twitter is gc gpe or no gcp egg e egg gcp egg at gcp egg and uh we, susan obviously is already following you and uh hopefully we'll get an update one day soon on your 2.0 project Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking so with much. you. And uh, even though fun. I'm not a philosopher, <laughs> have we a great day. Gotten in, we I'm did, a we, sculptor. We skate. Well, yeah, but you can't talk about these things without skating through all kinds of important thoughts. You know, the great, yeah. great, the great thoughts of how we got even to this I, point. I, you know? I kind of get it now. Yeah. Like now that we've come to this part of it, I, but I, you really had me for a while. I, <laughs> I didn't do well in statistics either or psychic. Well, but psychic you know, physics, that there are, you know, what seven only psychics, and, <laughs> you know, seven Sigma is like, or nine Sigma is very unlikely. Right. No, so, but I no, I understood a little bit of it, but I hope that everybody, um, makes it to the good part at the end. And, uh, Dr. Nelson, I will say farewell to you. Thank you so much. And I'll say goodbye to the audience as well. We'll see you tomorrow at three o'clock with, um, Oh, shoot. It's uh, J Jeremy. Jeremy uh, Murphy. We'll see you then. Three o'clock. Thank you, Caleb, for producing. And then Thank also, who do you have coming up after that? And then we have uh, Brigadier General Atta, Tata. Anthony Tata. Anthony Taha. Tata. To uh, educate us a little bit about uh, what's really going on over there in the Ukraine. I see him on a much many We're news Ending outlets. the week with a Tata. Yes, we will. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow at three o'clock. But what do you want done to your armpit? <laughs> 
That's no, really I, your armpits me. are very erogenous. I understand. Like, what what should be done to them? I don't know. I Is it mouth, tried. tongue? I guess. I don't know. We Try don't know. Sensitive. Tongue. Try okay. Tongue. All right. Thanks. I don't know. Any help me out here, uh, dude? You want to? <laughs> uh, you want to help? <laughs> you, want, you want to jump in the middle of this? Go ahead. <laughs> Come over here and show. Them. Oh my god. <laughs> Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 800- 273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.